the other midfielder that really stood out, whereas Portland seemed to lack that kind of playmaker uh, this weekend. Boy, did Vancouver find one in uh, Chumiamento. Um, he was fantastic against Toronto. And let's face it, Toronto um, looked pretty poor, but Giamento just sort of chewed those guys up and made some fantastic passes. Yeah, he, we met him. I met him in Arizona at a spring uh, spring training or preseason, whatever you want to call it, uh, game in Arizona. and interviewed him for a little bit, and he's, you know, he's one of these sort of internationally savvy guys. He's played abroad. He's played, he's jumped all over the place, so I don't want to mess up any games or teams we play with. But he's real slick on the ball. He's got really nice touch, and he's he's one of these guys in MLS that sort of slides into little holes, little gaps, just creates something and leaves that last pass off. And when I saw him play in preseason, it was against, I don't even remember who it was against, Chivas or something. You could tell then that once this guy was fit and, in, and sort of acclimated to the team, that he was going to be a real troublemaker for other teams. And um, that's one of their scores. I wasn't real impressed with the lineup or the roster that Vancouver's built, right. but he's one that um, they, they snuck away with one. And Dennis Hamlet, who was the assistant coach there, the old Chicago Fire guy, I talked to him for a while. He's like, "Yeah, it's a total score. We we got lucky with this guy, and yeah, what a he's going to catch a lot of people by surprise." Yeah, he was a- good. Absolutely great find. On the other hand, um, Toronto looked about as bad as um, uh, Brett and I talked about in preseason, especially with all their uh, preseason. Um, well, I mean, they did, they hardly had a roster. It, two weeks out they, from the from, they had sixteen from the season. players, and we did a preview. Yeah, it, it looked. I mean, they looked. Pretty overwhelmed, and uh, it looks like Aaron Venter may have underestimated the MLS. I'm not sure. What do you think? <laughs> what, what's what's funny about Toronto, and that's going to be one of the stories of this year, even though I think we probably all know, well, I shouldn't say we know where they're going to end up, but a lot of the players down at that tournament, was it, uh, oh, it was the one in Orlando where they lost. They lost to Orlando City FC or whatever it was yeah. in, the, in the consolation game. And the players were like, oh, no, heads up, heads up, we're okay. We know this is a rebuilding process. You know, we know it's going to take time. And here I'm saying, do, do your fan, does your fan base know that? Does your tortured fan base that's been you know watching for the last four years, one of what I think is one of the four or five best markets in the league, yep. know that you're all in for this might take a couple of years yep. to incorporate Vinter's scheme and to bring in the players he really wants. That 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 city and that market that they're impatient. You know, mm-hmm. they've been impatient for years. Yep. So I'm curious to see how much progress they actually make, but to hear their players who have already resigned to the fact that it's going to take time makes me a little nervous about how the fans are going to react up in Toronto. Yeah. Well, hasn't it been a rebuilding season since the expansion year for Toronto? Every yeah, season? Yeah. But it, yeah, every year it changes, but we saw that we saw how their sort of unrest manifested itself last year at MLS Cup. They didn't, you know, they were unhappy with the ownership that TFC fans they didn't show up at MLS Cup, or they showed up for 20 minutes and then they left the stadium. I mean, there's something bubbling there among those fans. They're unhappy with the way the team's been led and what the product on the field. So even though I think a lot of them like Aaron Vinter and they like the call to bring in Klinsman as consultant, I mean, if you're already talking about a rebuilding phase for the next year or two, man, if you're a Toronto fan, you've already been dragged through the mud a little bit. It's, it's going to be tough to haul yourself down to the MO field yeah. all the time, you know? That's for sure. Now, we're about out of time, but I did want to get one more question in. Uh, and it's not going to be uh, be about uh, Simon Borg's fear of movie theaters, which we'll get into oh, okay. another time <laughs> since we're almost <laughs> out of time. time. Get into that. That's a whole episode unto itself. <laughs> it is. But I, I kind of wanted to put you in a mildly sticky situation, but it's not going to be too bad. But all right. We had Steve Clare on our show from Prost America not too long ago, and he he talked about the 10 teams in the playoffs and, and the 10 playoff spots, and he said, you know what, there's a hint of illegitimacy when, you know, that many teams can make the playoffs, and yet, you know, that is kind of an American thing. Um, we do let a lot of teams into the playoffs in, in a lot of our, our sports, but um, one of the things that he brought up that he thought would make, you know, the whole playoff system a little bit more exciting um, was allowing the top seeds to pick their opponent. Uh, a la rugby, you know, uh, the big the big international rugby tournaments. And first of all, I just want to get your thoughts about, you know, 10 teams being in the playoffs now and, and your thoughts about his idea. Well, the 10 teams thing is, is tricky because um, I like some of it and I don't like other ideas of it. And I probably have the same arguments that anybody else would have. I think 
I think 10 teams in allows for some average teams into the postseason. It might dilute the process a little bit, and I think MLS has, sa has said that. They're a little concerned about that. Yeah. But what I do like about it is, and I really do, this isn't a sort of a league standpoint, is that it allows more teams the opportunity to make the postseason, so then those games are more important in September and October in markets where we need the, they need the fans. MLS needs the fans. They need people going out. They need energy and excitement. So a lot of the teams you'll see in the postseason normally, whether it's New York, L.A., uh, some of these other big markets, Seattle, fans are going to those games anyway. You know, They're going no matter what. So if you can get a couple extra fans in, say, Houston or Kansas City or Chivas, USA, Dallas. because there's maybe a play, yeah, Dallas. <laughs> maybe there's a postseason push involved. People mm -hmm. are going to go to those games. So that's that's what I like. And I know from an MLS standpoint, they're really eager to go into every season and unlike world football, unlike the EPL, say that your team has a chance to win every year. Yeah. They are really fixated on that. And they're, they're right. If you're a fan in England of a mid mid level team, you know going into the season you're not gonna win the EPL. You're not gonna, you know, be on top of the table at the end of the year. It's not gonna happen. But in MLS they like that parody. They like when fans can go into the season and say, and my team might win. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of the home team, what is it? The best team host picks their opponent. Is that what you? What, that yeah. Was Let's give the supporter sh uh, shield winner. Um, you know that that uh, honor. Yeah, I think. I mean, I don't. I'm not against the idea. I think they've. Uh, and this is something they're trying to fix: is giving the, the proper weight to winning the supporter shield. Right. Um, I, the only thing that deters me about that is that it it, it smells like a gimmick to me. Mm. And we're, you know, MLS doesn't want to be the only sport that X. You know what I mean? Sure. They don't want to deviate that much from NFL or NBA. They just don't. We can't. MLS can't afford to be the special league that has an interesting structure where the top team gets to pick who they play. It, it, it would benefit the supporter shield winners, but uh, MLS doesn't want to be that much different. They want to get on Sports Center. They want to be like all the other sports. So to have a gimmick makes it a little silly, just like the old you know, PK shootouts when it was, you know, like the hockey shootouts, things <laughs> right, like that. Right. They don't want to do that. So, yeah. you know, this Chad Ochocinco thing is another one. Oh. So that's like another gimmick. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Yeah. So I think MLS, from a front office standpoint, is past that, and they don't want to do those kinds of things. But it's certainly interesting, and they're trying to, like I said, give more weight to the supporter shield winner. So yeah. that's why they – you know, they will face the worst team left in the playoffs by the time those first two play-in games are done. Yeah. Whether or not that's as much of an advantage as it should be yeah. uh, remains to be seen. I'll have, have to see how it plays out in the first year with the new playoff system. Yeah, it's an old argument. It's going to go on for a long time, as you well know. And, well, Chad Ocho Cinco hasn't played soccer since he was 13, so I'd say right. his chances of making uh, Sporting Kansas City are about 0%. Right. And if he does make it, so. that would be bad for MLS, wouldn't it? In a way? That. I, th I mean, we have these conversations in the office, and I think most of us are against it. A, we're, nobody thinks he's actually going to make the team get a roster spot. Yeah. But it's it's just a gimmick. And if you're sporting Kansas City, I like I like how they did it. I mean, you guys know how they did it. They found him on Twitter, and yeah. they, their social media work was great. They found him on so, you know Twitter and tweeted out, and they developed this relationship. But when it comes down to the functional idea of, is Chad Ochocinco really going to play in Kansas City this year or be on a roster? It's a gimmick, and it's ridiculous. Yeah. And the best thing MLS can hope for is Chad Ochocinco to go in there and say, wow, these guys are actually better athletes than I thought, and they're in better that. shape. Yeah, I hope. And that's, that's yeah. the best thing they can hope for. I hope that happens, and I think it probably will. Now, we're out of time, time uh, Nick, but I hope when you come back next time, you could you could do one favor for us. And that's yeah. sit, sit down with Don Garber. Now, this is a we're asking a big favor here. Sit down with Don Garber and find out exactly um, if you could maybe get an explanation of what his he mentioned simulated relegation. And Brett and I are just we're just all interested in this. And if you could find out anything about what that really means for us, we'd be extra okay. thankful. Simulated relegation. Yeah, he, okay. he, he said that uh, at the halftime interview of the MLS Finals uh, for last season. He said he's wow. looking into, and we asked Jonah this too, and Jonah's like, I yeah. have no he idea what Don the, He doesn't question the Don, apparently. <laughs> no, he does. That's what he says. <laughs> I don't question what the Don says sometimes, he said. <laughs> what the Don says, the well, Don says. 
I, I've heard I've heard the term, but I have no idea what it means uh, in the real world. But we'll have to figure it out. Yeah. Well, I have my theories, and maybe I'll pass it on next time uh, uh, we talk. And uh, I want to thank you for for coming on and spending what ended up being probably a lot more of your time than you thought, and uh, and giving us your your insight on the season. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having us, guys. For having me.